okay if you go through testing and you find out that there's nothing that's a complication. It's okay if you go through testing and you find out that there is a complication, but you're not going to do anything about it immediately. But just having that knowledge, I think, helps you feel so much better. Today's episode is about my friend, Mandy Meneker. She and her husband, Eric, had been trying to have a baby for almost a year without success. And while her OBGYN encouraged them to keep trying on their own, Mandy decided that it was time to get some answers. Today's story should help demonstrate the value of seeking help from a specialist and give you some invaluable insights into how IVF works and how IVF results can change dramatically cycle by cycle. I'm Julie Campbell, and this is Infertility. Hi, everyone. Welcome to yet another episode of This is Infertility, where we share people's personal experiences with fertility and family building. Before we dive in, I just want to take a second to remind you that we have some resources available for anyone who might want to bring fertility and family building benefits to their employer at progeny.com slash talk to HR. Most employers that offer these benefits do so because an employee asks for it. So take advantage of our resources and help bring this life-changing benefit to your employer. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to get to know my good friend Mandy today. And I'm not saying my friend in the typical way that a podcast host might call someone they've recorded with their friend. I'm saying my friend because Mandy and I have actually been friends for years, and that friendship will play a part in her story. So it's safe to say that today's episode is extra special, and I'm super excited to be your host. Okay, let's get to know Mandy. So I think we started trying when I was around 32, I want to say. Uh, we had met when I was turning 25 and we got married right before I was turning 30. So by that point, we had been married for two years. We had been dating for about seven years. And so we felt like it was a really good time for us to start a family. So we had the IUD taken out. It started off as us just trying naturally. We thought it would be pretty easy to conceive. We didn't expect any challenges on the way. And then lo and behold, around a year later, we said, okay, maybe there's something that we need to take a look at. So I think around 10 months into trying, I went to see an OBGYN just for my regular appointment. And I remember feeling so frustrated because OBGYN said to me, oh, you're in your early 30s. You're fine. Just keep trying. And I felt like at 10 months, if it hasn't happened naturally, at least you should know if there is a problem and there is a roadblock that you need to work around. And so I'm really glad that I trusted my gut and I said, I'm not just going to keep trying. I'm not going to waste another six months feeling disappointed every month. So I reached out to my friend, Julie, she works at Progeny and I at the time didn't really understand anything about fertility clinics. I didn't know how they work. I didn't know if that's something you do through your regular OBGYN um, and so I said, you know, I, I really think that there might be something. I just want to look into it and see what's going on. And she was really helpful towards pointing me towards some different clinics that would take our insurance in New Jersey. I'm the Julie that Mandy just mentioned. Yep, Mandy called me and told me that she'd been trying for almost a year and she didn't want to just keep trying without at least getting some tests done to see if there was an issue that was preventing pregnancy from happening. At that point, she didn't know if she should find a new OBGYN or if she just needed to do something different. In fact, at that point, Mandy didn't even know if she was even allowed to see a fertility specialist. And the idea that a fertility specialist won't see someone until they've reached a specific trying-to-conceive milestone is actually a very common misconception that I would like to take this opportunity to dispel. This misconception comes from two things that happened concurrently ever since the inception of IVF in the late 1970s. The first item is the outdated definition of infertility that, and I quote, infertility is defined as the inability of opposite sex partners to achieve conception after at least one year of unprotected intercourse and or the inability of opposite sex partners to achieve conception after six months of unprotected intercourse when the female partner trying to conceive is age 35 or older. So whether it's intentional or unintentional, this definition can be found in a lot of medical health care insurance policies, and it serves as a barrier to accessing care. To put it simply, if you don't meet this narrow, outdated definition of infertility, you can't access infertility treatment coverage that may be available to you. The insurance plan won't cover any fertility treatment unless people can prove that they've been trying to conceive without success for a predetermined amount of time. 
It goes without saying, but there are some major flaws when it comes to that definition. The most glaring flaw is that those in same-sex relationships are unable to get pregnant by having sex at home with their partner. And the use of opposite-sex partner is a glaringly heteronormative requirement that automatically excludes these couples from having access to treatment coverage, even though they're paying the same insurance premiums to have access to medical health care insurance to begin with. The same is true for single parents by choice. They, too, don't meet this narrow definition because they don't have a partner at all. In general, there's a lot of reasons that someone might not be getting pregnant from having sex. And many of those reasons can be diagnosed by undergoing a fertility evaluation with a fertility doctor. So seeing a fertility specialist earlier can make a really big difference in your journey. Anyway, it's 2024, and I think it's safe to say that people shouldn't really live their lives based on this outdated definition of infertility. These days, more insurance companies have updated their policies in this language in an attempt to grant coverage access to people who don't necessarily fit the traditional definition of infertility. In fact, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, also known as ASRM, well, they're the organization that governs the fertility industry, and they provide clinical guidance for fertility doctors. They've even updated the definition of infertility to be inclusive of everyone. So if you feel like seeing a fertility doctor might help in any way, you're probably right especially if your employer offers coverage like the progeny benefit. And that, my friends, is what I told Mandy. She, of course, didn't really know where to start when it came to looking for a fertility doctor, but she came to the right woman for the job, as this just so happens to be my specialty. I've been working in the fertility industry at Progeny for over a decade now, so I was able to recommend a great clinic, and she was off on her way to start her journey with an initial evaluation and diagnostic workup. So the full testing process takes about three to four weeks from start to finish. For the male, it's fairly easy. They do a sperm sample. They do, you know, maybe one checkup. There's not too much there. Um, For the woman, there's multiple ultrasounds. There's a special test called an HSG. There's blood work. So there's a lot of things that they do just to rule out anything that could be a problem. Um, We did end up finding a complication And the doctors told us that if we were continuing to try naturally, that our our, uh, chance of a natural pregnancy would be less than 1%. So we chatted with them about all of the available options, and it seemed like for our unique complications, IVF was going to be the best way forward. So Mandy was on the right track. Of course, picking a fertility clinic can be difficult, but for Mandy, it was easy. And I was able to recommend a great clinic for her. Unfortunately, though, not everybody has a trusted friend like me that works in the fertility industry who can help make recommendations. But I do have a great resource for you that you can use to find a clinic without my assistance. Progeny has the largest network of fertility clinics in the United States, and we strictly vet all of our clinics and doctors for the highest quality. So if a doctor and clinic is in network with Progeny, you can sleep soundly at night knowing that they are a top quality provider. And even if you don't have access to the progeny benefit through your employer, you can still use our network search tool to make sure that you go somewhere that operates with the highest standards of care and quality. So if you're looking for a clinic, use our provider search tool at progeny.com slash find a provider. So Mandy and Eric were officially diagnosed and their recommended treatment plan was to undergo IVF, also known as in vitro fertilization. For some, the thought of undergoing IVF can be pretty intimidating, but that wasn't really the case for Mandy. For us, for my husband, Eric, and I, when we found out that IVF was going to be the best course forward, I feel like we felt really confident in going that route because we have a lot of family members, we have a lot of friends who have been through fertility journeys, and knowing how good the science is today and how much it's improved really made us feel confident that the doctors we were talking to knew what they, that what they were talking about, that this was going to be the right next step for us. And so I feel like we went into IVF feeling really hopeful and feeling like even though it's a more invasive procedure than some of the other fertility options out there, it seemed like it was the thing that was going to get us quickest to our goal, which was starting a family. So leading up to IVF, Mandy and Eric were hopeful and even a little bit excited. But when it came time for treatment to start, Mandy did experience some hurdles. I think one of the biggest adjustments with IVF in the beginning was the resentment that you have around your partner. Because no matter what's causing you to need to go through IVF, it's tough when you know that you're going to go through this incredibly complex journey where you're going to be taking all these medications, you're 
entire schedule is going to have to change. Your exercise is going to have to change. So many things in your life are having to change. And it's hard when you know that you're the one that's carrying that burden because there's only so much that your partner can do. And so I think in the beginning, it, it did take me a little bit of time to process I'm going to need to go through this very uneven process where whether it takes one round or it takes four rounds, I'm going to be the one that's that's taking on the bulk of this work on my body and the bulk of the emotional toll. And then beyond that, if we're successful, I'm also going to be carrying the baby for the next year. And so I think in the beginning, that was something that was really tough to deal with. I actually spent a lot of time listening to the This Is Infertility podcast. And scrapbooking and taking walks (laughs) just as a way to to process, you know, everything that I was going through. IVF is not a treatment where you just go in, see a doctor, and a couple hours later, you get results. Quite the opposite. The treatment process itself can take several weeks, and that's if it works on the first attempt. There's a lot of doctor's visits, a lot of injectable medications to administer yourself at home, and a lot of variables to keep track of which is why Mandy knew that it was important to share her experience with her friends and family. I had decided from the get-go that for me personally, it was easier to talk about IVF and to be really transparent with the people in my life that mean a lot to me that this was something I was going through. And I'm really happy that I was honest with my friends and my family because IVF is a huge commitment. And there's a lot of times that we had to make adjustments. For example, we were planning to visit my in-laws for Thanksgiving. And then my retrieval got scheduled for the day before Thanksgiving. So my in-laws actually came to us. Um, I had a bachelorette trip that I was planning for a friend. And I said, you know, can we move it between these two months because of some of the procedures I have coming up? Um, I was at a birthday party upstate and ended up needing to take shots in the middle of the restaurant bathroom (laughs) during a birthday dinner because that's just when I needed to take shots. And so I think being really open with a lot of my friends and family about what I was going through was really, really helpful. Um, It is sometimes tough, though, for people to really understand what you're going through if they haven't actually been through it themselves. So I also found that listening to podcasts, reading other people's stories, that really helped me to know I wasn't alone and to hear people that had been to a similar journey. Mandy and Eric were very optimistic going into their IVF cycle. They knew that they were at a great clinic. They knew that IVF had great success rates based on their diagnosis. And so they were confident as they moved along with their treatment. We had an incredibly high yield of eggs. And coming out of that, when you look at the statistics, you think that when you have a a super high amount of eggs, that you're going to end up with a lot of embryos. And so based on our initial egg count, based on all of the statistics and the the numbers that we had, the nurse we were working with said, you know, I think you're going to end up with six to eight at the end of this process, which is incredible because for IVF, you want anywhere from about two to three healthy embryos on ice for every sibling that you want. We wanted the option to have more than one. So we went through the process pretty optimistically. We had great yield. Um, We're waiting to hear the results. And then we got a call for our first round. And the nurse prefaced it by saying, we never expected this to happen. Um, You lost an additional 10 embryos this week. And there's two embryos. And... At the end of the day, two embryos is incredible. We didn't know yet if these were healthy. We hadn't tested them. But to have two embryos is a really stunning outcome that a lot of people are very excited for. But I think because our nurse had framed it in such a way that it sounded like our outcome would be so different, and because she sounded so disappointed when she communicated the news to us, for me, it felt more like I was grieving the loss of those embryos than being able to celebrate the two that made it. Now, two embryos isn't a bad result, not by a long shot. But for Mandy and Eric, two embryos was not what they were expecting. And because they knew that they eventually wanted to try for another baby down the road, this news was tough. And that's when she gave me a call. And I let her know that this didn't have to mean that they would only be able to have one child. And I remember I actually reached out to my friend Juliet Progeny at the time and said, you know, I'm really struggling with this. I know that two is still a blessing, but because our expectations were so much higher for this round and the way that it was communicated, 
it feels like it didn't go well. And she at the time said to me, every single batch of eggs every month is a completely fresh batch. And it's completely different. And you are starting fresh the next time that you start. And there are so many families out there that go through this process and are happy and healthy and are able to put together families. And it just made me realize how many families out there happen in different ways. You know, there's people who adopt, there's people who are legal guardians, there's people who help to raise family members' kids, there's, you know, friends that are found family. And I think that was just a really good reminder that we were incredibly lucky to be getting to go through this process. And even though it hadn't gone 100% the way we expected, it was such a great start to the IVF experience because it helped us realize that every time we get a healthy embryo at the end, that's incredible. I'm happy to hear that I helped put her mind at ease a bit. She took a little time and then decided to undergo another round of IVF. We took a month off and we went immediately into our second retrieval. And on the second retrieval, we tried a lot of different things. Um, I was eating gluten-free and dairy-free. I was doing acupuncture. I was just, you know, basically the doctors were just throwing things at us saying, try these things. We don't know what the problem was. We'll just try again. Um, We, again, had a high retrieval. We ended up with one embryo. But the difference was with that one embryo at the end, we felt joyful when we got to that one because we had reset our expectations to know that any healthy embryo is, is positive. So after two rounds of IVF, they had three embryos. And because they wanted to have more than one baby eventually, they made the decision that it probably made sense to do a third retrieval cycle. So we decided to, at that point it was November 2021, uh, we decided we would do a third round, but decided to push that out a little bit till March 2022. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I think first off, I was so anxious by that point that I realized that I actually needed support beyond my family and my friends. So I found a wonderful therapist who specializes in anxiety and I was able to work with her on a number of the things that had come up and the feelings I was having. Um, I did end up going on anxiety medication, which made a tremendous difference. Um, I also had been in a very stressful job, and so I actually accepted a much less stressful, much more sustainable position um, and left my job. I took some time off between those two roles just to have a little bit of time for myself. And so by the time that March hit, it felt like I was a completely new person. Like I had really done a full reset and just given my body and my mind a chance to to start over. And so we went into March, 2022 um, with different drugs, different medications that we were going to try this time. Um, But I was much more relaxed. I was on anxiety medication. I had a more sustainable job. I, I knew what to expect. And we had our absolute best round. So we ended up having nine blastocysts. Three of those were not genetically normal when we tested them. So we ended up with six, which was double the number from any other round. The third round was more successful than all of the others, which just goes to show that IVF can yield different results for the same person from cycle to cycle. In fact, I vividly recall telling Mandy that her uterus and ovaries were like a garden, and it resonated with her. I explained to her that sometimes every month it yields different crops. Sometimes you needed to switch up the fertilizer. Sometimes you need to add more water. Sometimes sunlight's a factor. Sometimes you can be doing all the same things from month to month and yield different results. It's just out of our control. And it doesn't mean that you're necessarily doing anything wrong. It's just natural factors that are outside of your control. That's just the nature of IVF and how it works sometimes. After this last attempt... Mandy, Eric, and their doctor all agreed that it made the most sense to officially finally move forward with an embryo transfer. The nurses always say once you've done the transfer, um, not to take an at-home pregnancy test. Um, My nurse confirmed that about 99% of people do not listen to that advice because you're very excited. (laughs) So I actually um, took an at-home pregnancy test and, and that's how I first got a positive and I am someone who, for whatever reason, when I would take the um, the ovulation test, they weren't coming back positive. Even when I had 
I had COVID and this is before COVID tests existed. And so I wasn't able to get a positive then. I was like, I just want a positive on a stick. I don't care what it's for. Um, so the first time that it came back positive, I, I broke down crying and I, and I showed my husband. Um, but it almost didn't feel real because we had at this point, it had been about two years of trying nationally for a year and going through all the IVF process, and multiple retrievals for a year. And again, you know, two years for some people is so minimal compared to what they go through. And so we just feel really fortunate that, that we were able to get pregnant. Um, and I, I think it, you know, it almost didn't feel like I, I it's like when you, you assume you're just going to pee on a stick and you're going to be pregnant one day and that's what you think it'll look like. And I think having gone through this whole journey to get there, one of the things that felt like such a cool benefit of IVF was the fact that we already had tested the embryo. We knew the sex. Um, in our case, we did actually know the sex. We knew that the embryo was healthy. We knew that the embryo had a lower chance of miscarriage just based on the things that they were able to test for. Um, and so going into that pregnancy, I think we were a lot more confident in knowing that we had put in a healthy embryo than we would been would have been uh, had we only conceived naturally. And so I think that is one of the, the amazing benefits of IVF, the fact that even though it's a lot of work to get there, that you can pre-test an embryo. Finally, after three IVF retrieval cycles and one embryo transfer, Mandy was pregnant. Mandy and Eric went through a lot, but at the end of the day, they reached their goal. And about eight months later, Mandy decided that she wanted to share some of what she learned from this experience. So she wrote an article titled, What a Difficult Fertility Journey Taught Me About Being a Better Communicator, for the website PR Daily. I decided to write an article um, detailing my experience and some of the lessons that I learned on the way. And a huge part of writing that article was just wanting to get in front of more people that might not know that others are going through this. Um, and in that article, I included some of the different tips and some of the things that I had learned along the way. So I actually think the thing that was the most meaningful and the most fun was celebrating milestones on the way to your end goal. And this was actually a tip that I think I had originally gotten from Juliet Progeny. Um, as you're going through the IVF journey, let's say that the typical retrieval cycle is maybe, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 days, depending on where you bookmark it. Um, so I would set up uh, almost like a, like a Christmas calendar <laughs> where you get like a gift every day on the way. I would set up different um, milestone celebrations. So maybe on night five, I would order delivery food from my favorite restaurant. And on night 10, I would plan to meet a friend out for dinner. Um, and then after the retrieval, I would plan one big, um, one big gift to myself. Um, so for example, I mentioned during this second retrieval, I was gluten-free and dairy-free. And I received a catalog for Zabars in the mail. And for those of you that don't live in New York, Zabars is this amazing grocery store with locks and babka and just all these incredible, delicious things that I couldn't eat during the second retrieval. And so the day after that retrieval, my gift to myself was I went to Zabars and just went on a shopping spree and bought locks and bagels and cream cheese and everything I wanted to enjoy. I'm so happy that Mandy brought this up. Yes, that is actually a go-to piece of advice that I always give people all of the time when they come to me for help. IVF is a long road. And as someone who has undergone two egg retrievals and is currently in the process of creating embryos, I can tell you firsthand that there are some major ups and there are some major downs. We can't control exactly what's going to happen in the end. And that's a struggle, the loss of control. So go ahead. When something good happens in your cycle, regardless how minor, like having the courage to inject yourself for the first time, a good evaluation, or an encouraging sonogram at a monitoring appointment, allow yourself to celebrate even just a little. Maybe even get yourself a little treat. Take joy where you can find it in the journey. Mandy had a lot of great advice in her article, which we'll link to in the show notes. The other one that I really um, think I leaned into was that there's no shame in asking for help. And I think, you know, I definitely reached out to friends during this time. I mentioned I, I reached out to a therapist, which helped a lot. 
Um, but one way that I was also able to make that a fun thing was that every night when I would take shots, I would listen to a different song. And at first, during the first round, it was anything with puns having to do with shots, like I shot the sheriff or shots, 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 or any songs I could come up with with shots. But there's only so many of those songs. And so I started between rounds and, uh, two and three, I started crowdsourcing. And so all my friends would get to submit a song for a different night of shots. And I think that that was also a way to make it fun and communal, where I would have these pump up songs that I would listen to every night when I took the medication that would make me think of the people in my life who were supportive and who knew I was going through this. Um, And it was really fun to be able to crowdsource that information. I was so excited when Mandy called me to share the news that she was pregnant. And when Zoe, Mandy and Eric's beautiful daughter, came into existence, it made my heart so full and so happy. But wait, there's more. Surprisingly, soon after that, Mandy had some more news to share. We were actually incredibly shocked when my daughter Zoe was four months old. Um, We found out that we have another baby on the way. Um, So we are pregnant now. Um, I looked into the research afterwards, and apparently one in five women who've gone through IVF are actually able to conceive naturally afterwards. Um, I think it's some combination of the medication that you take and your body sustaining a healthy pregnancy definitely helps. And for whatever reason, one in five couples can actually get pregnant naturally. So um, knowing that we were told originally that we had less than a 1% chance of conceiving naturally, and now knowing that I am four months along, um, my my daughter and, and my soon-to-be son will be about 13 months apart. So we really went from a long fertility journey into really diving into this parenting journey. I can't even begin to tell you how proud I am of Mandy for the fierce infertility advocate that she's become, for her bravery and courage that she displayed during her journey, and for paying it forward to help raise awareness and support others to let them know that they're not alone in their journeys. And with that, I want to thank Mandy for sharing her experience with us here today. And I want to thank you for listening. Just remember, the purpose of stories like this isn't to give you a blueprint of how you should be building your family but rather to give you comfort in knowing that you really aren't alone in your journey. There are a lot of people who are going through their own journeys and experiences with fertility treatment. And while not all endings are the same, we hope that you can take comfort in knowing that there are options and support out there. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to connect with us, you can do so on Instagram at This Is Infertility Podcast. If you want to follow Progeny, you can do so at Progeny Inc. Of course, if you're listening on a podcast app, please leave us a rating and a review. This is Infertility is brought to you by Progeny. Please remember, this podcast is not intended to substitute for the personalized expert advice of your physician. I'm Julie Campbell, and this is Infertility.